Welcome back to a new edition, The Science Behind the Coronavirus. In this fourth installment of this series, we're looking at a very important question. The viral variants that are circulating worldwide in the effort to protect against them. Joining me today for this discussion is Professor Shabir Mahdi, a virologist who has led South Africa's clinical trials of the AstraZeneca coronavirus vaccine. Days ago, the South African government made a stunning announcement. It would halt distribution of a million doses of the vaccine after tests found it didn't prevent disease from the variant that's ravaging that country. Professor Shabir Mahdi has led this investigation in these vaccine trials and delivered these stunning results of his research during a government briefing. When looking at vaccine efficacy against this particular variant, uh, we have not been able to determine that the vaccine actually protects against mild to moderate illness. Today, we'll discuss what this means for South Africa and for the future of vaccine development and distribution around the world. We'll also hear directly from Professor Madi about the enormous sacrifice researchers are making in order to determine how best to protect the population of South Africa against the virus and this new variant in particular. Before we start, as full disclosure, my company, Immunibio, is developing a COVID-19 vaccine and we've been given permission to begin trials in South Africa. We are going into the heart of the storm and with our vaccine trying to address this variant. So now I'm pleased to have Professor Shabir Mahdi join me from Johannesburg. Professor, welcome. Oh, good day, thank you for having me. So let's start a little bit about the really important news you released on the webinar and the paper that you've now published with regard to what you found with regard to this variant. And maybe for our lay public, and this specifically affects not only the South Africans, but the spread of this variant throughout the world. If you could just very briefly describe what you found. So Patrick, the study which we did was a phase two study of the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, and it, because it was a phase two study, we were somewhat guarded in terms of the spectrum of individuals that were allowed to be enrolled into the study. Uh, really between 18 and 65 years of age without too, many, too much in a way of underlying illnesses that could predispose them to developing severe disease. The main objectives of the study were foremost to establish the safety of the vaccine and secondly to determine whether the vaccine would protect against COVID-19 irrespective of severity of illness. Uh, the summary of it is that after having received two doses of the vaccine, uh, the immediate the final conclusions of the study was that this particular vaccine did not protect against mild and moderate infection due to the SARS-CoV-2. It was a consequence of infection with what is known as a B1351 variant, which is the variant that evolved in South Africa and has subsequently spread to many, many other countries, including the United States. Uh, what is important of this variant is that uh, the virus has developed uh, mutations, which makes it uh, less, uh, which makes it resistant to the antibody that is induced by past infection with the original virus that was circulating and seemingly also resistant uh, to the antibody that is induced with the AstraZeneca vaccine, as well as probably many of the other first generation COVID-19 vaccines that are being deployed throughout the world. But at the same time, I think it's important to emphasize that that doesn't necessarily mean that this particular vaccine or any of the other vaccines won't protect against severe disease. And what it tells us is that to be able to protect against infection probably is a much higher bar than what is required of a vaccine to be able to protect against severe disease. When you first saw the results of those uh, two figures of this neutralization, it's a devastating, actually disappointing finding. You, you'd hope not to see that. How did you feel? I just want to get your, your personal experience about that. How, how did you feel about that? If it's a yeah, so the lab results came in about a week before we unblinded the study to see what was the clinical effect of the, of the, of the vaccine itself. Uh, when the lab results came out, uh, it wasn't completely surprising because it was earlier work that was done by Alex Siegel as well as Penny Moore against uh, what was in convalescent sera. And when we saw the results for uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine in terms of the reduction of uh, the activity of the antibody against the virus, uh, that was obviously disappointing. Uh, 
uh, and it sort of made me a bit pessimistic in terms of what to expect uh, of the eventual efficacy readout once we unblinded the study. Uh, in terms of uh, what has subsequently happened, within a few days later, we were ready to uh, unblind the study because we had accrued sufficient number of COVID-19 cases to get an answer to the question that we posed. And the question that we had posed was whether this vaccine would have at least 60% efficacy against uh, all severity COVID-19. And I recall walking out, my, off my, out of my office uh, about to go home and down the corridor came the statistician with a very tearful look on her face. Uh, and then she told me, listen, I've done the analysis and pretty much we don't have any vaccine efficacy to speak about, uh, which was obviously extremely disheartening. Uh, but I think after it had settled in, I think uh, the, that I realized just how important this finding was to the field of COVID-19 vaccines. It was usually disappointing to the rest of my team, to the number of people that have worked on these studies. I mean, across the South Africa, there's seven teams and probably about a quarter of the staff that have worked on these vaccine trials in the different uh, settings were actually infected with the virus during oh, wow. the course of conducting this trial. Uh, so it's been a huge amount of effort and it has come at huge costs to the staff that have been working on these studies. So obviously, Everyone has been disappointed, but at the same time, uh, we know that we've now contributed to the knowledge set, which tells us uh, that the game is far from over when it comes to developing a COVID-19 vaccine that is going to be resilient and that's going to be able to actually eventually gain control of the transmission of this virus. You, you, you thought that, or you made the statement that this uh, virus will be here in our lifetime. And how long will we be dealing with this? Yes, I think COVID-19 is here to stay. Uh, the virus itself is not going to be eradicated anytime soon, extremely unlikely. Uh, but I think the target right now is to try to reduce the frequency of these resurgences and the magnitude of the resurgences. Uh, and that is what the focus needs to be. It's not about get eradicating the virus. Unless you're an island nation such as New Zealand, or Australia, or Iceland, uh, and you pretty much keep your borders shut or have an extremely strict quarantine process when there are incoming visitors, uh, it's highly unlikely that anywhere else in the world you're going to be really successful in eradicating the virus. Uh, so we probably need to recalibrate in terms of our expectations of uh, how to manage the pandemic as well as in terms of what to expect of vaccines. So what probably would end up happening for all intents and purposes is that this will probably become the next uh, common, co one of the other coronaviruses that becomes almost endemic in humans. Uh, we've got four other common cold coronaviruses that cause uh, are more of a nuisance than anything else. But I think in the instance of this particular virus, we probably will still see uh, ongoing number of people dying from COVID-19 into the foreseeable future with uh, or without vaccines. But obviously, vaccines are going to tremendously reduce the number of deaths uh, that will result from this infection with this particular virus. And in addition to that, it would uh, relieve the pressure on our healthcare systems. So vaccines are probably the only sustainable option that we've got at hand to be able to bring the pandemic under control, uh, to reduce the frequency of the resurgences, and to reduce the magnitude of those resurgences. Give me a little bit your understanding of how this mutation arose and it's not just in, our, in your country, and I say our country because uh, I was born in South Africa, um, but it's going to rise elsewhere. So if you can just give us your insight uh, and your experience, starting from Eastern Cape and all the way up Africa, South Africa and all the way to Wits and how rapidly it spread. So I think you're absolutely spot on. Some of the mutations that do take place in viruses as well as other organisms are uh, pretty much an error of the reading code, uh, which codes for the different proteins. And that error can take place at random. But more importantly, the type of mutations that we're experiencing are a consequence of the virus coming under what we call immune pressure. That is, the virus is being exposed to these antibodies that are either induced by natural infection or through vaccination. And for the virus to continue surviving, it needs to adapt itself to evade those sort of antibodies that are directed against it. What happened in South Africa is during the course of the first wave, and similarly probably in Manaus in Brazil, during the course of the first wave, there was a tremendous force of infection taking place. All of the serosurveys, when we test blood samples from individuals to see if they've been previously infected or not, 
uh, all of the CIRA surveys that were conducted in South Africa indicate that as many as 30% of South Africans were likely uh, infected during the course of the first wave. So that means there was a huge number of people that had developed antibody against the original virus that were circulating. Unfortunately, the virus continued circula circulating in South Africa even when that first wave started to plateau off. Uh, and consequently, with this huge amount of ongoing transmission of the virus, which was now faced by this uh, faced uh, these antibodies that was being induced, to, for the virus to continue surviving, it required it to mutate to try to. And essentially, these mutations are a consequence of what we call immune evasion, uh, which is where the virus are adapting to uh, evade uh, immune antibodies, specifically uh, that's been induced by natural infection in our instance. But as you correctly point out, uh, as uh, vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines are rolled out, and especially if the rollout is very sluggish, in that you've got a very slow uptake of those vaccines, and if the virus continues circulating, it provides almost fertile ground for the virus to mutate against those antibodies that have been induced by vaccination, or let alone by past uh, natural infection. So this is something which is a phenomenon of not just the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but something that exists for influenza viruses as, as well, as an example. And that being one of the reasons why each year we're needing to revaccinate against influenza virus because of what we call as anti antigenic uh, shift that takes place or antigenic drift that takes place in that there are the subtle mutations that allows the virus to start evading the immune responses that's been induced previously against it. So very much what you said, uh, basically is there's more antibody around directed against the virus. For the virus to continue surviving, it needs to adapt, it mutates, to try to evade that antibody that's been directed against it. I understand that South Africa has now put on hold the million doses that AstraZeneca has shipped in uh, from, uh, from India for distribution to the um, healthcare population in South Africa. Just talk about that a little bit and, uh, and, and the reasoning behind that and then the strategy of how to address that. So I think it's important just to place it into context in that the South African strategy for rollout of COVID-19 vaccines was looking at three different phases. In phase one, it was meant to be healthcare workers. In phase two, it's meant to be individuals at high risk of developing severe disease. Uh, and then in phase three, the more general public. Now, when it comes to healthcare workers, we need to appreciate uh, that uh, the South African healthcare working force, although there is a percentage of them, probably about 15 to 20%, that are at high risk of developing severe disease, the other 80% probably are not at high risk of developing severe disease. They are at high risk of being infected to the virus by work because of them working in healthcare facilities, which is sort of completely overwhelmed with individuals with COVID. So they're at high risk of being infected but not necessarily all of them being at high risk of developing severe disease. So in the context of a vaccine, which we now show is not actually uh, efficacious in terms of protecting against mild or moderate infection due to the variant that is dominating in South Africa, uh, it wouldn't be a wise use of limited resources for us to go all out and vaccinate all healthcare workers with the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, knowing that close on to 80% of them don't stand to benefit in any way because they are the ones that even if infected would only develop mild or perhaps some moderate illness, which the vaccine simply is not protecting against. Uh, but that being said, it doesn't mean that the vaccine won't necessarily protect against severe disease. And I think there's good biological reasons to believe that even the AstraZeneca vaccine that hasn't been efficacious in preventing mild and moderate illness might still protect against severe disease. And the basis of that is that the AstraZeneca vaccine uses almost an identical technology as the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, in that they both are non-replicating vector-based vaccines. Uh, in addition to which, when looking at immune responses of these two vaccines uh, in a healthy population, uh, they're pretty much identical after the first dose. And we know that a J&J &J vaccine in South Africa, when evaluated in a population that are at high, were at high risk of developing severe disease, in fact, reduce moderate to severe disease by about 57% and severe disease and death by as high as 89%. So we've got two vaccines that are both on similar sort of technology uh, as well as are inducing similar sort of immune responses, uh, but they've been tested in very different populations and they've come up with very different answers uh, because of the different populations they've been tested in as well as they've looked at different outcomes.
as the main endpoints of the study. So the decision not to go ahead with the AstraZeneca vaccine in healthcare workers, I think it's a proper, it's a correct decision because, like I said, it would very much be a waste of vaccines to be part targeting a group where they're simply not going to benefit much, uh, at least for those individuals that don't have underlying comorbidities or not uh, of above 60 years of age and at risk of high uh, at risk of severe disease. Uh, rather, that vaccine should be repurposed uh, to the more general population who otherwise wouldn't have access to vaccine, uh, but still remain at high risk of developing severe disease. Let's turn a little bit more deeper into these mutations because people get confused when you talk about the UK mutation, the Brazilian mutation, the South African mutation. What is really, really, really more important is that these multiple mutations happening in the same virus, meaning the 501Y, the 484, and now the Californian 452. These numbers, by the way, are the locations of the amino acids on the virus. And you sort of put in this word here that there are now mutations, while we're focusing on where, where these two things stick to the receptor, the mutations on the other side around this virus that are occurring that are as important, to, it appears, in terms of absence of neutralization. You call this N-terminal domain and S1 and S2, highly technical. We've discovered that, we've looked at that. So share with me and with the audience when we talk about these multiple mutations, it's not just a single mutation, and how more dangerous they become when it's just more than one. So absolutely, and I think the experiments that have been done in the laboratory attest to what you are mentioning, and that it is the constellation of mutations that makes the virus less likely to be susceptible or more resistant to the antibody that's been uh, induced either by natural infection or by vaccine-induced uh, antibody. Uh, so the experiments that have been done is that when we construct these viruses and only include one uh, mutation, uh, there's still some amount of activity of the antibody against the virus. When you increase the number of mutations to three mutations, depending on which component of the virus you're looking at, then you've got even further diminished in terms of antibody activity. And then when you include a full set of mutations in these virus constructs and you test it in a the laboratory, then you get pretty much complete knockout of antibody activity for some of the vaccines. So it's not just a single mutation that's important, it's really the constellation of mutations which cumulatively makes the virus eventually more resistant to both vaccine-induced uh, antibody as well as to naturally, uh, natural infection-induced antibody. Uh, so I think this is, again, a phenomenon that, we prob that probably evolves over time. I don't think all of these mutations necessarily have taken place concurrently. Uh, what we're observing in the United Kingdom right now, we have got a, what is known as a Kent variant, uh, which uh, basically evolved around about October as well. More recently, they've now identified uh, that uh, in that Kent variant, there's sort of a new uh, sort of a mutation taking place involving this e, what we call the E484 mutation, which is considered to be one of the more important mutations, rendering, rendering the virus to become somewhat resistant to the antibody that's uh, induced by past infection from the original virus or the vaccine. So you are correct. It's really a constellation of mutations that are sort of a determining factor in just terms of how resistant the virus becomes to the antibody that has been induced. So, and you're seeing these constellations of mutations now in South Africa, as I understand it, when we talk about the 484501, uh, and in fact, um, what is presented, there were eight mutations, and now you're seeing even more in the same virus. Uh, that's correct. And there are some critical mutations, at least five of which, uh, which are directly associated with a type of antibody that we're wanting uh, to work against, uh, against the virus. Uh, so that's what's rendering some of these vaccines uh, not to be too active. In fact, for some of them, they're not active at all, at least when it comes in relation to the antibody that's being induced. There might still be other underlying immune uh, immunity that's been induced through vaccination, what is known as T lymphocyte immunity. Uh, which is somewhat being relatively conserved compared to the activity of the antibody that's being induced. But again, uh, it's really the constellation of these mutations. And in the South African variant, there's at least five mutations uh, which are especially important, uh, which is making the virus resistant to the antibody that's been induced from past infection, as well as, unfortunately, as an example, uh, 
with the AstraZeneca vaccine. And I, I think the final subject I want to cover with you, um, Professor Glenda Gray also presented the results on the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine, which was a single shot vaccine. Um, can you comment a little bit about that uh, in terms of how you're going to uh, approach that single shot vaccine in South Africa? Yeah, so I think the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was evaluated as a single shot under emergency use and in response to resurgences. It doesn't necessarily mean that a vaccine is going to be sustainable in terms of its protection uh, after a short period of time. Uh, and I think that sort of uh, results still need to be forthcoming in terms of the duration of protection that's induced by a single dose. Uh, I would be very surprised, considering the immune responses that are induced by a single dose, that you're going to get sustained protection. I think even with a Johnson & Johnson vaccine, under emergency conditions, when you're faced with a resurgence, it's great that you can get protection after a single dose. In fact, even with the AstraZeneca vaccine, before the variant arose in South Africa, when we analyzed the data on a post hoc basis, we found that even 14 days after a single dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine, it was able to reduce infection, mild and moderate infection from the original virus by 75%. And so I think all vaccines, including the messenger RNA vaccines, which induce a very sort of somewhat mediocre immune response after a single dose, are still getting protection against the original virus that was circulating. Uh, but it's really the duration of protection which is important. And I think for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, we probably would require a booster dose, either with a Johnson & Johnson vaccine or perhaps with another vaccine. So a combination of vaccines might well lend itself to even a more robust immune response and a broader repertoire of immune response than giving the same vaccine twice, uh, twice over. Uh, so the Johnson & Johnson data clearly provides uh, hope in that when, you experience, when you're experiencing a massive resurgence, get in with the vaccine, give as many people a single dose as quickly as possible, and you can protect people from severe disease and from dying, or at least substantially reduce their risk. But as a long-term strategy, I think for most vaccines, it's really going to need to be a prime and boost strategy either with the same vaccine, but probably preferably not with the same vaccine, because you do get some level of immune tolerance uh, when you're using a similar sort of construct, and you might be able to overcome that to some extent if you were to sort of combine vaccines, which is where the field is really heading to, even in terms of the evaluation of the first generation of COVID vaccines. So that was an interesting concept, was now you say we, you now, the field is now heading towards combining vaccines, um, a Johnson & Johnson vaccine with the Pfizer vaccine or Johnson & Johnson vaccine with the AstraZeneca vaccine, etc. And I think that's a, it's a potentially good approach uh, because perhaps uh, these antibodies, all antibody-based, by the way, uh, S and S and S, <laughs> um, would um, have maybe a, a synergistic effect. We don't know that. I question, however, uh, the logic of taking a sort of um, relatively ineffective S vaccine and a relatively ineffective another S vaccine and putting them together and hoping you get a better S vaccine. And a better, lo <laughs> a better logic would be to say can take an S vaccine with an N vaccine, and now you have activation of two parts of the immune system. And again, with full disclosure, that's what I'll be working with you and the, and the, the country. So before we end this, uh, this, ep this session, um, our viewers always want and should have not only um, real hope, but hope based on science. So if you could leave our audience with some uh, words of hope uh, and inspiration of where you see this going. And then frankly, if there are any other things that you want to share with us that I've not covered, I'd love you to have that opportunity. Thanks, Patrick. And I, I think uh, after the disappointment which I've experienced in the past few days with the results of the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, clearly there needs to be reason for hope. And I think the hope does still exist. Uh, I think there's a, there's a, a shining ray of light that uh, is upon us in terms of there being optimism that what we can do immediately is protect people from dying uh, from COVID-19. We can substantially reduce their risk. We can safeguard our healthcare services. We can assist our healthcare workers uh, by being able to vaccinate people and reduce the chances of being able to develop moderate disease as well as severe disease, even with the vaccine such as the AstraZeneca vaccine. So I think we're in a very different space than we were six months ago, uh, when there was very little hope, in fact, uh, 
uh, there was a lot of optimism, a uh, lot of speak, but nothing really on the table which showed that the first generation of COVID-19 vaccines were going to work at all. In fact, even the regulatory authorities had already set a threshold of 50% efficacy to warrant uh, a vaccine moving forward to being used under emergency uh, utilization. Uh, so we basically have breached that sort of threshold and the current vaccines have worked fantastically against the original variants that were circulating, but currently we do experience problems in terms of the evolution of the virus and the ability of those vaccines to continue. But the summary of it is we've got vaccines. We've got vaccines, we've got life-saving vaccines, and we cannot dismiss the current generation of vaccines, but at the same time, we need to be exploring uh, better vaccines that are more suited to purpose, not just to protect against severe disease, but that, that, are, that are also able to reduce the transmission of the virus, that are also able to protect against asymptomatic infection, or at least reduce the infectiousness of people that are asymptomatic and are able to reduce mild infections. And it is with that type of vaccine that we will hopefully be able to get back to some level of normalcy in terms of our life. Well, I can't tell you how much I want to thank you, not only <clears throat> for your time, but for your dedication to this work. And I really look forward to um, coming back home again uh, to continue <laughs> this conversation. Uh, thank you, Patrick. And we look forward to welcoming you back home and we look forward to working with you. So thanks okay. for hosting me. Welcome to another edition of Science Behind the Coronavirus. In this fourth installment of the series, we're looking at a very important issue today that's affecting all of us. The viral variants that are circulating worldwide and the efforts to protect against them. So now I'm pleased to have Professor Shabir Madi join me from Johannesburg. Uh, Professor, welcome and thank you for taking the time to join us. Now, Shabir, that's when I heard your statement on Sunday that 50% of these patients were seropositive before. That in fact, and this is what really scared me, when you use, use the word immune pressure, that in fact it was the basis of the fact that people had antibodies because they were infected. And therefore the virus was continuing to mutate around it because the na na native infection or natural infection actually in itself is an immune suppressor. So there may be some uh, viruses continuing to grow. Now I'm going to take you through a logic gate that is torturing me. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to sort of see how we solve this, hopefully together in South Africa. And so logic gate that's torturing me as follows. If we know that every time you have an antibody in your body, whether it be from a natural infection or from a vaccine, it provides the virus an opportunity to mutate. It actually provides the fundamental seed for the virus to mutate because that's immune pressure or what you call antigenic drift. One way to stop that is to have a vaccine that prevents its replication. So it can grow and therefore, can't, you don't, and therefore the end point is infection mild to moderate infection rather than just inhibition of severe disease. So, I'm taking you through the logic gate now. If we know all these facts that in the presence of an antibody, we create the seed for the virus to mutate, and then we create another antibody which creates that mutation to remutate because there's thousands of opportunities for it to mutate. Is it therefore not logical that we should be looking at a whole different strategy, not just to say the bar is prevent severe disease, which is really important by the way. What we're doing is exactly right, I exactly just said we should be doing that, but looking at today's new science where the bar is to prevent them from replicating in the first place so they do not have this opportunity to use these antibodies against to which to mutate. I want to throw that out to you because it's a very deep subject that's been torturing me from the day this pandemic uh, occurred. In one year, literally, literally, I'm sitting here today, one year ago, we've said the strategy must be 
to eradicate this virus. Obviously, the holy grail is to get what we call sterile immunity. But if you can get there, we need to actually have a system of the entire immune system to eradicate it quickly before it uses the body to mutate and generate what we now think sadly will be an endemic beyond a pandemic. So I want you to react to that, Shavir, because I need the scientists who are actually at ground level. I see this as Vietnam or the war, and you guys are at the front lines, uh, seeing this in real time every day. Um, maybe if you don't mind reacting to this logic gate, or I put it an illogic gate of the strategy that we are taking as a world. Sure. So I think you're absolutely correct uh, in that the ideal, and the ideal vaccine that we require is one which has got neutralizing activity against the virus, uh, but at the same time induces a broad enough repertoire of immune response, uh, which won't always be susceptible uh, to uh, the virus mutating. Uh, so in addition to the antibody that's been induced and also the antibody itself, it, it might be that we're able to direct the antibody against a part of the stalk protein, as an example, which is relatively conserved, somewhat hidden from the immune system, uh, but at the same time allows for the antibody to work when uh, the person is initially infected. And as an example with uh, influenza vaccines, uh, what one of the things that has been considered is what is known as a stalk protein, or the stem of the hemagglutinin, which is a part of that same part which is usually uh, used to design a vaccine, but is somewhat hidden and uh, much more stable. But in addition to that, what we want vaccines also to do is to induce what is known as T-lymphocyte immunity. Uh, and then again, those, there's a much broader repertoire of uh, immune responses targeted at different components of be it the spike protein or one of the other proteins that are much more conserved in the virus. Uh, and that is the type of vaccine that we're wanting. The first generation of vaccines that we've got at hand uh, somewhat probably uh, what I would call crude vaccines in that it targets a very visible component of the virus and consequently it lends itself to these sort of mutations taking place. But it's obviously a start uh, and I think it's been a glorious start in terms of the initial success. But I think what's been unmasked now with evolution of these uh, variants that have become resistant to some of this vaccine-induced antibody is that that is not the only route to go, and we need to look at a much more broader repertoire of vaccine-induced immune responses uh, to the virus itself. Another statement you made, which really disturbed me, was you said not only is this mutation more infective, but they were more virulent. Could you um, give us a little more color on that statement that you made? Uh, so this is some data that has come out from the United Kingdom uh, where they basically did analysis and uh, although there's some sort of uh, uncertainty in terms of the exact increased virulence of the variant that's circulating in the United Kingdom, which shares one characteristic similar to the South African variant or the variant that started off uh, in South Africa, the variant in the United Kingdom, which is known as the B117 variant, uh, in fact, it's less worrisome in that it doesn't contain this, it doesn't include these critical mutations, at least until recently, which would cause it to be evasive to the immunity that's induced by past infection or vaccine induced immunity. But this mutation that did take place increases the affinity of the virus to be able to infect humans. Uh, and uh, some of the initial uh, indications uh, recently released from the United Kingdom. Uh, suggests that that particular variant in the United Kingdom might have increased uh, its virulence by anything between 30 to 50 percent uh, compared to the original virus. So people developing more severe disease and more likely to die, especially obviously if they've got underlying uh, risk factors for severe disease. So there is some uh, uncertainty in terms of the exact magnitude of the increase of the virulence of the virus in the United Kingdom. Uh, in South Africa, where we've got less robust surveillance systems, uh, it's been difficult to untangle as to whether the variant circulating in South Africa is also more virulent than the original virus that was circulating. Uh, there's certainly been an increase in terms of the number of people that have been infected, as well as the number of deaths that have taken place during the course of the resurgence. But I think that's more a function of the increased transmissibility of the virus rather than virus uh, being more virulent uh, in that causing more severe disease in any one individual. Uh, but so when looking at individuals that are hospitalized in South Africa as an example, uh, 
we're looking at what percentage of them would go on to die, that number in South Africa has remained fairly stable, unlike in you know, the United Kingdom where the data suggests otherwise. Shabir, talk, talk to me a little bit about what, what's your plans and how, what's your plans to do this expansion? Uh, so I think uh, in the immediate future, what we require is a recalibration of our expectations of this first generation of COVID-19 vaccines. I think they still got an extremely important role to play in terms of protecting individuals from developing severe disease. Uh, but this first generation of COVID-19 vaccines are not the vaccines that are going to get us to the so-called herd immunity threshold. Uh, if there's any vaccine that's ever going to get us to that threshold, I'm not too sure. Uh, but we really require to basically look at alternative approaches to vaccine, which goes beyond just looking at a spike protein as the target, which is what, except for the inactivated uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, all of the other current generation of uh, COVID-19 vaccines are only focused on the spike protein of the virus, at least those that have been currently authorized for use. So I think what this uh, experience teaches us is that we really need to look beyond the spike protein, look at other components of the virus to which if we induce an immune response, it would be assist in terms of either uh, facilitate expediting the destruction of the virus once a person is infected or at least neutralize its activity. And I think that's where the focus needs to shift at least for the next generation of COVID-19 vaccines. So there's, there's the issue of the implementation uh, and the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines. And then there's the issue of getting vaccines that are designed differently uh, that hopefully will be more successful and less vulnerable uh, to these sort of mutations that uh, seem to arise when we're only targeting one specific component of the virus, which in this instance has been the spike protein. <music>
a failed concept, especially now in the light of these mutations. And this is why this national uh, var uh, vaccine nationalism is such a failed and flawed concept. Walk me through, i am been in the last maybe four or five months communicating with uh, the leadership in South Africa, including yourselves and um, the MRC and um, elements of the government. South Africa seems to be on the forefront, um, not only of the science, on the clinical analysis and really making impact of real information that will impact the world. One, how did that come about? Two, uh, where do you see your future uh, of, of South Africa truly being the forefront to try and lead the world um, in understanding and finding a way to combat this virus? So I think there's been a number of strengths as well as weaknesses, unfortunately, in South Africa. On the scientific front, I think building on the research that's been done around HIV, tuberculosis, in my own case, of vaccines, which is what I've been looking at for the past 25, 26 years, uh, over time, we've been able to develop expertise, which sort of allowed itself to basically redirect and repurpose uh, its use to tackle COVID-19 as a community. And I think uh, we, there was a strong sense of collaboration within the country among scientists. And each of the scientists really sort of rose to the occasion in terms of moving it forward. Uh, we were fortunate in that there were some funds that were made available as an example by the Department of Science and Innovation, as well as the Medical Research Council, that really assisted scientists to get kick-started with their research agendas. And like I said, the important part of it, especially as an example, when it comes to the sequencing of the virus, uh, South Africa probably was one of the top countries in terms of having a program in place right from the outset of the pandemic to do systematic sequencing of the virus and consequently why we were able to identify the variant as early as we did. Uh, and much probably much more or much more robust system than probably that existed in the United States at a point in time. So that is some of the strengths in that we did leverage of expertise that has been built up over the past uh, two to three decades because of work in the field of HIV, because of work in the field of tuberculosis and other vaccine preventable diseases. Uh, but at the same time, there are weaknesses, and those weaknesses are not just specific to South Africa, but probably weaknesses that are throughout the African continent. And one of the major weaknesses uh, is that we don't have the capacity and capability, and we haven't actually developed it, uh, to really move to the field of uh, vaccine development from the laboratory and taking it right through to the manufacturing process and allowing for South Africa to be the suppliers of the vaccine to its own population as well as to other countries in Africa. Unfortunately, that lack of investment is, uh, the failure of that is multifactorial. Uh, I don't think it's just government's responsibility. Yes, government needs to provide the funds to allow for the research to take place and to create an enabling environment for it to happen. But it's also unfortunately a failure of the private sector as well as to some extent a failure of, acad of academia. Uh, in that that hasn't really been a focus, despite the science being on the wall for decades now, uh, where South Africa needs to develop that cap capability and capacity, it simply doesn't happen when it comes to vaccine production. A good example is in 2009 with the swine flu pandemic. Uh, after the swine flu pandemic, there was a lot of political talk about ensuring that Africa becomes more sustainable and more de self, uh, self, uh, more self. Uh, they become much more uh, self-liable in terms of being able to produce uh, vaccines generally. Uh, but since uh, in 2009, with the swine flu pandemic, uh, vaccines eventually did become available to Africa, but only after the pandemic had passed. Uh, and that was should have been a wake-up call. And there was political speak in terms of correcting that to increase capability when it comes to vaccine manufacture on the continent. But until today, unfortunately, there's no country on the continent that has the capacity to be able to produce, manufacture vaccines from scratch. And like I said, at a level of the science, unfortunately, we haven't taken it to that level where we can actually uh, develop these vaccines in the laboratory. And in the case of SARS-CoV-2, uh, it really shouldn't be too much of a high hurdle, a high bar to sort of clear. We've seen a number of institutions, uh, we know there's probably about 240 vaccines that are either in clinical or preclinical development. Uh, but there has been a systematic failure on the continent, including in South Africa, when it comes to actual vaccine uh, discovery, 
as well as development. And unfortunately, when it comes to manufacture, uh, that is a challenge which we need to address and we should have addressed uh, probably a decade ago.